myself. <laughs> oh, hello and welcome to the third and final episode of Stage Center Productions video series. In this segment, we're revisiting two beloved comedies that have made successful transitions from stage to screen and vice versa. In Same Time Next Year, accountant George Peters and housewife Doris meet at an inn in February 1951. They have an affair and agree to meet once a year, despite the fact both are married to others. Over the course of the next 24 years, they develop a deep emotional intimacy as they discuss the births, deaths, and marital problems each is experiencing at home, while adapting to the social changes affecting their lives. The original Broadway production of Same Time Next Year received a Tony nomination for Best Play and won Ellen Burstyn a Tony Award and a Drama Desk Award. Burstyn reprised her role in a 1978 film adaptation with Alan Alda. Here now is the final scene from Same Time Next Year. So good. So do you. But you look tired. Are you okay? I've looked this way for years. You just never noticed. <laughs> anyway, I feel much better now that I'm here. This room. <laughs> it's always had that effect on me. It never changes, does it? It's almost the only thing that doesn't. I find that comfortable. Old Chalmers is still the same. He must be 75 years old now. You remember when we first came here? <laughs> we called him Old Chalmers then. He must have been about the same age then as we are now. Now, that I don't find so comfortable. <laughs> we were much younger. Have we changed much? Of course. I grew up with you. You remember the dumb lies I used to tell? I miss them. <laughs> oh, I don't. It was no fun being that insecure. And what about me? Have I grown up too? I think that you were already growing up when I met you. Tell me something. Anything. <laughs> Why is it whenever I look at you, I want to put my hands all over you? <laughs> you always were a sex maniac. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if I can get a fire going, huh? You know, I figured out that with the cost of firewood, it's cheaper to buy furniture, break it up, and burn it. Things that tight. Oh, no. I'm okay. I've been doing some teaching at UCLA. Music? <laughs> Accounting. With things changing the way they are, figures are still the only things that don't lie. Doris, why did you sell your business? How did you find that out? I'll tell you later. What made you do it? I was bought out by a, a large chain. It, it was the right offer at the right time. And you don't miss the action? Not yet. I guess I'm still enjoying being one of the idle rich. <laughs> what do you do with yourself? I read, watch TV, play a little golf, visit the grandchildren, you know, all the jet set stuff. <sighs> and I thought you loved working. <laughs> Well, there was another factor. Harry had a heart attack. Now, it wasn't a major one, but he needed my help at the time. And anyway, it isn't as if I've retired permanently. There's a local election coming up in a few months, and I've been approached to run. On what ticket? Independent. Oh, figures. <laughs> Harry's OK now. He runs three miles a day, has a body like Mark Spitz. But unfortunately, he still has a face like Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to tell you a nice story about him? Sure. When they were wheeling him out of intensive care, Harry asked the doctor, and he said, Doc, give it to me straight. After I get out of here, will I be able to play the piano? And the doctor said, of course. Then Harry said, funny, 
I couldn't when I came in. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, Harry never makes jokes, but he saw how, how panicky I was, and he wanted to make me feel better. How are you and Harry, emotionally? We're comfortable. Comfortable? Oh, it's not such a bad state. The word has been given a bad reputation by the young. <laughs> Where's your luggage? Still in the car? I didn't bring any. I can't stay, Doris. Why? I have so much to say and such little time to say it, so I'm just going to start. First of all, Helen has known about us for 10 years. When did you find that out? Two months ago. And she never confronted you with it before? No. Well, what made her tell you now? She didn't. We have a very close friend, Connie. Have I ever mentioned her to you before? Connie told me. Ten years, and she never even hinted that she knew. <laughs> that may be the nicest story I've ever told about her. Your wife's an amazing woman. She passed away, Doris. I lost her six months ago. It was all very fast. I'm sorry to blurt out like this, but I couldn't think of a more graceful way to tell you. Are you okay, honey? It's, it's so strange. I've never met Helen, and yet I feel as if I've lost my best friend. It's crazy. Are the kids all right? They'll survive. I don't think I would have made it through the whole thing without them. I just wish you reached out to me. I did. That's how I knew you sold the stores. I, I called and they gave me your home number. I let the phone ring four times and, and then I hung up. But I felt much better knowing you were there if I needed you. I just wish you'd spoken to me. I didn't want to intrude. I didn't feel I had the right. My God, that's terrible. We should have been together. Well, I've been thinking about us a lot lately. All the things we've been through together, the times we've shared, the ways we've helped each other. Do you know that we have made love 113 <laughs> times? <laughs> oh, I figured that out on my Bomar calculator. It's wonderful to know someone that well. There isn't anything about you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's two sugars, right? No, one. <laughs> so I don't know everything about you. <laughs> I don't know who your favorite movie stars are, and I couldn't remember the name of your favorite perfume. I wrapped my brain, but I couldn't remember. That's funny. It's my sin. <laughs> but I do know that in 24 years, I have never been out of love with you. I find that amazing. So what do you say, Doris? You want to get married? Married? We shouldn't even be doing this. I'm serious. You really are, aren't you? Well, what did you think I was? Just another summer romance? A simple yes will do. There's no such thing. What is it? I was just thinking of all the times I've dreamed of you asking me this. He's got me out of a lot of bad times. I want to thank you for that. What did you say to me all those times? I always said yes. And you're hesitating now? Do you realize I am giving you the opportunity to marry a man who's known you for 24 years and cannot walk by you without wanting to grab your ass? 
You always were a sweet talker. <laughs> That's because if I told you how I really felt about you, it would sound like a medley of cliches from popular songs. Will you marry me? I can't. Why not? I'm already married. And you feel you have to stay because he needs you? No, it's a lot of things. It's... It's respect, affection, a sense, a sense of continuity. We share all the same memories. It's, it's, it's comfortable. Perhaps that's what marriage is all about in the end. I don't know. Will you tell me why I had to be so stupid five years ago and help you get back together? Why was I so damn generous? Because you felt the same way about Helen then as I feel about Harry now. And if I hadn't gone back to Harry, you might have been stuck with me permanently and you were terrified. You could always see through me, couldn't you? <laughs> That's okay. I always loved what I saw. Well, I want you now. And you can still have me once a year, same time, same place. Doris, I need a wife. I'm not the kind of man who can live alone. Look, I wanted you to marry me, but I knew when I came in here that there was a chance you might say no. I guess what I'm saying is that Without you, I'm probably going to end up with Connie. Now, she knows about us, but the point is, she's not the sort of woman who will accept the situation. I suppose what I'm saying is that we'll probably never see each other again. Oh, you're trembling. It's just the thought of never seeing you again absolutely terrifies me. Oh, Doris. For God's sakes, marry me. I can't. I wish there was something I could tell you that would make you break your heart and burst into tears and come away with me. <laughs> you know us Italians. We never cry. I've got a plane to catch. What time is it? 5.55? No, I always keep my watch. Three hours and 25 minutes fast. How long have you been doing that? <laughs> Twenty odd years. Why would anyone do a thing like that? Personal idiosyncrasy. <laughs> Who were your favorite movie stars? Lon McAllister, Cary Grant, Marlon Brando, and Laurence Olivier. You've come such a long way. We both have. You keep your watch three hours and 25 minutes fast, huh? I can't believe this is happening to us. Everything is falling When you're not around I keep on wondering When my time will come Okay, I'm back. God damn it. What about Connie? Connie is 89 years old. <laughs> Look, I wanted you to marry me, and I figured that if you thought someone else wanted me, I might stand a better chance. I was desperate, okay? Look, for once in my life, I wanted to have a happy ending. Listen, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm back, and I'm going to keep coming back every year until our bones are too brittle to risk contact. The one that I love, Ooh. desperately in love with you, desperately in love, I'm desperately in love with you, desperately in <laughs> Our next presentation, from The Graduate, is based on the popular 1967 film, 
which received seven Oscar nominations and is ranked by the American Film Institute as the 17th greatest American film of all time. It's 1964, and Benjamin has returned to his California home for the summer after successfully completing four years of college. Despite that, he's not sure what to do with the rest of his life. During the summer, he falls in love with a young woman, Elaine. To his shock, Mrs. Robinson, her mother, attempts to seduce him. Here is the iconic scene from The Graduate. Robinson, I'm kind of distraught at the moment. I'm sorry to be rude, but I have things on my mind. It's good to see you. How are you? I'm sorry not to be congenial, but I'm trying to think. Is there an ashtray in here anywhere? It, no. What are you upset about? Some personal things. Girl trouble? What? Do you have girl trouble? Mrs. Robinson, I'm sorry to be this way. But right I, now, I'm, I'm just- I'm a little like, unsteady myself. Your mother said I should come up here and lie down. There's a spare room at the end of the hall. Are you drinking? I don't drink. You don't drink? As a rule. Of course I drink, but not as a rule. What do you drink? Bourbon? I have a lot on my mind. May I, I ask you a question? Uh-huh. What do you think of me? What? What do you think of me? Uh... You've known me nearly your whole life. You must think something. Look, this is a rather strange conversation. I really ought to get down You don't down have any opinions at all? No. My father, maybe I begin Benjamin. any minute. What? Did you know I was an alcoholic? Mrs. Robinson, I don't want to talk about this. You never suspected? No. <laughs> My God, Benjamin. I fall out of cars. I, I insult senators at fondue parties. Surely you must have formed some Mrs. sort of- Mrs. Robinson, this is none of my business. You it's... never even suspected. Would you excuse me? Come back here and sit down. I'm going downstairs now. Why? Because I want to be alone. There are three dozen people down there. Well, then I'll go for a walk. I need to get out of here. Would you take me home? Sorry? I want you to drive me home. My husband is flying to Chicago. I don't like to be alone. Oh, God. What? It, no. No. What? Mrs. Robinson, you didn't... I what? mean, you did... What's wrong? I mean, you didn't think I'd really do something like that. Like what? What do you think? Well, I don't know. For God's sake, Mrs. Robinson. You come to my room, you sit on the bed, you smoke a cigarette. Then you start opening up your personal life to me, and now you're asking me to take you home because your husband is flying to Chicago. So? Mrs. Robinson, you are trying to seduce me, aren't you? Aren't you? Well, no, I hadn't thought of that. But Benjamin, I'm very flattered. Mrs. Robinson, would you forgive me? What? Will you forgive me for what I just said? It's all right. It's not all right. That's the worst thing I've ever said to anyone. I've heard worse. Please forgive me, because I don't think of you that way. It's just, I'm it's all mixed up. all right. Calm down. It makes me sick that I said that to you. I forgive you. Can you? Can you ever forget I said that? Well, just forget it right now. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's forgotten. Good. Benjamin. Yes? Would you unzip my dress? On your... What? Your mother said that I should lie down. The spare bed is piled high with coats. 
Do you mind if I lie down, Benjamin? No, be my guest. Good night. Benjamin, would you please unzip the dress? I'd rather not. Do you still think I'm trying to seduce you? No, I don't. With your parents just downstairs. I'm going downstairs. You've known me your whole life. I know that. Well then, would you please? It's hard for me to reach. Thank you. You're welcome. What are you scared of? I'm not scared of anything. Then why do you keep moving away? Because this is my room. And if you're going to lie down, I don't think I should be here. Whoa. Haven't you ever seen anyone in a slip before? Well, not in my parents' house, no. Do you still think I'm trying to seduce you? No, but what if they walked in? Well, what if they did? Well, it would look pretty funny, wouldn't it? I don't see why. I'm twice your age. That's not the point. Benjamin, I am not trying to seduce you. I know that. Would you like me to seduce you? What? Is that what you're trying to say? I'm going downstairs now. I apologize for what I said. I hope you can forget about it. I am going downstairs. We hope you've enjoyed our video series. We know you are as anxious to get back to live theater as we are. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. On behalf of Stage Center, thank you for your patronage through the years and your continued support during this difficult time. If you wish to make a tax-deductible charitable donation, please visit stagecenterproductions.com and click on the Donate tab. Or call Kathy at 416-299-5557. Thank you again for your support. We'll see you soon.